Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk with you guys today. So, um, yeah, I'm a computational astrophysicist, so you know my day job is not thinking about aliens. Um, it's kind of my night job. So my day job is studying things like uh, how stars form and how planets evaporate. I do a magneto fluid, large scale supercomputer magneto uh, fluid dynamical simulations of ga astrophysical gas dynamics. But because I do a lot of work with the public, you know, I've been thinking, I've ended up having to think a lot about climate change because I write about climate change. Um, and over the years, you know, I've had to deal with a lot of climate denial. And that is unbelievably frustrating. And in doing that, um, I came to start thinking about the problem differently, about how you know, ways of, the ways in which we frame climate change entirely wrong. Um, and so that's really what the, the topic of my book is. So Light of the Stars, Alien Worlds, and the Fate of the Earth. Uh, so what I want to take you through is a kind of a different perspective on thinking about climate change um, from what I would call the astrobiological perspective. So the idea here is you can't solve a problem until you understand it, and you can't understand it until you can tell its story. And my premise here is that the story we're telling about climate change is the wrong story. And it's not our fault, it's just that we're in a different position now and we can tell a different story. Um, and the story we're trying to tell about uh, the, the, is, is the human future. What is the human future on a climate changing planet? But in some sense, really what I'm asking is, what is the future for any civilization, um, a large scale industrial civilization on any planet? And I'm gonna take you through why that's not a crazy question to ask. Um, so the problem we know is climate change, right? That uh, the anthropo anthropogenically driven uh, change in the planetary state um, that we are switching from uh, a, a state for the last 10,000 years that's been basically warm and moist uh, meaning most of the stuff isn't locked, most of the, or not most, but lots of the water isn't locked up in ice, to something um, that we don't know, right? We're pushing the earth into a new state. Uh, and then there's also, coupled to this, are issues of resource depletion from fresh water to forests. Um, so, you know, this issue of sustainability comes up, right? Can we build a sustainable version of our planet? And when we think about science and politics, right, because that somehow, whenever we want to have this conversation, it immediately falls into uh, the political domain. And while certainly policy is a, you know, there's going to be politics, the science itself is what gets cast, suddenly becomes political. And when you think about this, it's really amazing. And when I did the research for this book, I realized that, um, or I found that actually a president in 1965 gave a speech to Congress identifying CO2 and climate change as a potential problem, right? So the idea that somehow this is this modern hoax that uh, you know, climate denialists want to tell you about, is this gives lie to it, that you know, in 1965, actually that should be, President Johnson gave a speech before Congress where he you know, uh, mentioned CO2 as, uh, and climate change as a particular problem. But so you know, what's happening now is this political polarization, that somehow this science issue got lumped into all the other kinds of polarization that we have. So if you have a certain set of beliefs for some reason, you also have to think that climate change is a hoax or climate change isn't happening. Um, and that's part of the dilemma we face in trying to take any action on the problem. So what is the real problem? You know, what is the real problem that we're facing? Um, and it's really one of uh, a perspective not politics, because the science right has been settled for a long time. My first job after uh, undergraduate, I took a year and a half off and I did lots of crazy things like planted trees in British Columbia. I was a bouncer at the Rocky Horror Picture Show on uh, the A Street Playhouse in New York. But I also got a job in 1985 at um, Jim Hansen's Goddard Institute for Space Studies. And it, you know, I asked them, you know, I was a programmer basically, a scientific program, and I said, you know, what are we doing here? And they said, oh, you know, we're studying to see whether or not cl the climate's gonna be changing. That's an idea we have. And I was like, whoa, right? So this was 1985, long before anybody else had heard of it. By 1988, Hansen gives that very famous uh, uh, testimony in front of Congress saying like, look, we actually have found the signal. So the, you know, the science is old. And so the science is not the problem. It's the perspective that's the problem. And our perspective, I think the reason we have such a hard time, uh, uh, you know, the public, and I deal a lot with the public through my science writing, is that um, we think it's a one-time story. We think we are a one-time story, right? We think climate change is something happening to us, uh, and, you know, that's the only time it's ever happened, and there's no guides, no examples, no other, no way of framing this that allows us to see something deeper in it. So, uh, so all we end up doing is fighting about whether it's happening or not. Okay, so what I'm uh, gonna argue in the book is that we have to broaden the perspective to truly understand uh, what is truly happening. That's the basic idea here.
So what I mean by that is we must learn to think like a planet. And that is something that, you know, over our history, our 10,000 year history of civilization, we've never been called upon to do it bef before. And by civilization, what I mean is agriculture, city building, right? Clearly human beings have been around longer than that. But it's in the post-Holocene, or the, you know, after the ice, last ice ages ended, not post-Holocene, but after post-ice age, that, you know, we built this kind of, we started building this kind of civilization. And it's only now that we, the planet is starting to notice that we're here. And in order to deal with the problem, we're going to have to start thinking the way a planet thinks. And what I want to argue is we've only learned how to do that in the last 20 years or so for a bunch of reasons. Okay, so a little test. Um, which of these is the Earth? <laughs> what? Is it all of them? All of them, yeah, that's right. That's exactly the question. I mean, oh, yeah, I'm always glad when people see that, right? So, you know, the idea here is here's six different Earths, right? That this, this one is the Earth uh, and in the Hadean, right after it formed, it was a liquid magma ocean. Uh, this is a version of the Earth that was a water world. It took a while for the continents to grow. So when you, when you see those you know, animations of the continents sliding all around, those only go back a few you know, hundred million years or so, because in the beginning, all we had were what were called cratons. They were, it took a while for the continents to grow. So Earth was a water world. There were periods when the planet has been so warm that there's been virtually no ice anywhere on it. So we've been a jungle world. There's been periods when the Earth has been a snowball, basically glaciated almost from top to bottom, uh, or from a pole to equator. Here's the Earth, we, the happy Earth we know now, and here is the Earth, you know, actually not all that long, and maybe another two billion years or so, that as the sun heats up, like any main sequence star will do, um, the temperature is going to get high enough to push the Earth outside of the um, habitable zone. So the point here is that the Earth has worn many masks. Right? And we need, you know, what, what's happening with us now is we're changing the mask that the Earth is about to wear. So we should get used to this, um, and it should become part of our story. Now, you know, the Earth, so as I said, the Earth has had worn many masks. I love this uh, 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 diagram that um, a friend of mine, or a guy I know, I knew drew just a beautiful representation of all the different eras and epochs and eons of the uh, Earth's history. And you see all of the different times and the different kinds of animals, but what's important is we're up here in the Holocene, right? And, and each of these different Earths represents wildly different conditions that the planet has passed through, okay? But what we have been living in, in the last 10,000 years, which geologically is not that long, is the Holocene, and here's a record of temperature, and there's zero. This is variations from, uh, uh, from the current average, and here's ice content. What you can see is the ice has been going up and then down, up and down, and these periods when the temperature sort of pokes above zero, is these are interglacials. So the Holocene, which is the entire history of human civilization, is just the latest, um, uh, uh, latest interglacial. So the whole of human civilization, all our history, all our, our, our wars and hardship and creativity has been uh, in the Holocene. But if you look at the Earth's history overall, and this is one of the revolutions I'm going to talk about that we've undergone in the last 20 or 30 years that give us this new perspective on what's happening to us with climate change, you see how dramatically life uh, has played a role in these transitions. So what, here's another question, these are the only two, I promise, the only two test questions. What would happen if you landed on the Earth about three billion years ago and walked out of your spaceship? What's the first thing that would happen? You'd suffocate, very good. So, because, you know, what's amazing, even though the Earth had lots of life on it, life had been on the Earth for a billion years, there was no oxygen in the atmosphere, right? The oxygen, it was a, it was a pure, almost a nitrogen CO2 atmosphere, um, and uh, the, um, most of the uh, oxygen got put in place around 2.5 billion years ago in what's called the Great Oxidation Event. So this is a plot of oxygen concentration versus time, and you can see the oxygen content was a million times less than it is today, uh, back then, even though the Earth had, was rich with life. And what created the Great Oxidation Event? It was blue-green bacteria. It was the invention of a new kind of photosynthesis that used water as a substrate and burped out or farted out depending how you want to look at it, uh, farted out oxygen, thereby changing the atmosphere of the entire planet and changing the entire evolutionary um, uh, uh, history, the evolutionary trajectory from that point on. Not just for life, though it had huge consequences, right? You couldn't have big brains that, like we have without the energy that comes with oxygen metabolism, but also for the planet itself. By having all this oxygen, it completely changed the chemical cycles that regulated the planet's, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, the planet's history. For example, it created ozone, 
Without an ozone layer, you could never, you know, th th without ozone, you would completely change the dynamics of the surface. From the life's perspective, without ozone, you could never have colonized land. So it was, it was uh, the, the step in the great oxidation event that actually allowed um, the land to be colonized. So this is an example, and it's something very important for us now, that life is constantly co-evolving with the planet. Right? So this is a, in this plot, what we see is, on this side is things that have happened in Earth's history, going back four billion years, and things that have happened in life's history. And you see there's this constant feedback between them, where the development of uh, methane-eating bacteria will drive um, uh, uh, the great uh, uh, snowball, uh, snowball uh, phases of the Earth's history. Um, having oxygen allowed sex, actually, to happen, because it created, uh, allowed you know, uh, organisms to figure out um, sexual reproduction. So, Life and planets co-evolve. That should be a lesson for any life on any planet, right? What we've seen is that the biosphere uh, is an important actor in the history of our planet, and we should expect that it should be an uh, important actor in at least other, some other planets. So this leads to what is called the Gaia hypothesis, which you know uh, is, is very con ha was controversial, but let me tell you a little about it. It was proposed by James Lovelock in 1979, and the idea was that all living things on Earth kind of function as a superorganism that, that creates, self-regulates the planet for, um, the, for life, right? That basically, you know, even though the sun is increasing in temperature, the feedback loops created by particularly microorganisms will regulate the planet's temperature to keep it cool even though the overall solar uh, radiation that's hitting your planet is going up. Um, and this was actually an incredibly important idea. Here is, uh, it was Lovelock and L the famous biologist Lynn Margellis who got together and sort of really built this. And it was a very controversial idea when it was first proposed. And part of that because it became kind of a new age, sort of, you know, there were Gaian churches and there were Gaian, you know, uh, uh, festivals. It became a very new age woo idea. And there was one reason why scientists didn't like it, though, was because of the idea of teleology. It somehow seemed like it implied like the Earth wanted to go somewhere, like the Earth had a mind and it was trying to, you know, direct itself for some purpose. And of course, we know that uh, evolution is blind, right? But over time, both you know, Margellis and Lovelock were able to show that there's no teleology here. These are, this is still blind evolution, um, but that these feedbacks do in fact work. And so what happened was people kind of dropped the name Gaia and it became Earth Systems Science. We, talk, we now don't talk about Gaia, we talk about the coupled Earth systems. And by that we mean um, the biosphere. Uh, the uh, atmosphere, the hydrosphere, which is all the water, the cryosphere, which ends up playing a huge role, all the ice, and then the lithosphere. So what we now understand is that the Earth is this very strongly coupled system, uh, a coupled systems. They all interact, and that life has been driving a lot of this uh, evolution for quite a long time. So that was really the main result of Gaia, was to get scientists to understand that life is not some green scruff just sitting on the surface passively, that it hijacked the planet a long time ago. And when we think astrobiologically, this is a key idea for us as we go hunting for other biospheres. So right now there's an enormous amount of work, some of it going right on uh, over at MIT, um, developing models of exobiospheres, and they're using these kinds of ideas as the fundamental way we're going to detect life on other planets. We're going to look for signatures of biospheres, chemical signatures of biospheres. It's a very Gaian idea. Um, and actually goes back to Lovelock in 1963. He actually proposed that idea. So, so this leads us now to the Anthropocene, right? So now we have some background here about, you know, about life and coevolution and planets. We come back to ourselves which is our entry into the Anthropocene. So the idea of the Anthropocene, it was first proposed by Crutzen and Stromer in 2002, and they were thinking in terms of strata. They were actually proposing that, you know, a million years from now, you would be able to see the Earth's entry, you know, or our presence by a, a layer of strata that would have chemical or isotopic signatures of our presence. But even more than that, it was the recognition that human beings now are the, are the drivers, the principal drivers of changes in those coupled planetary systems. Right? And this has now been uh, verified in multiple ways, things like we can, you know, it's human beings who move around uh, most of the phosphorus on the planet. Climate change is an obvious example. Land colonization, there's many, many markers you can find to show that really it's human beings that are driving how this system behaves, which means we're pushing it, right? So the 
climate, or the, those coupled systems, it's a nonlinear complex system. Right now, it's been sitting at the bottom of a well, right, you know, in potential energy, so to speak. And now we've been rocking it hard enough over the last 150 years that we're now, you know, it's starting to roll off into some other state. So the Anthropocene is something that is happening. Um, uh, and the question is, what are its outcomes? And do its outcomes include us, right? So the entry into the Anthropocene raises profound new questions about the nature of human activity uh, within the coupled planetary systems. And what I want to show is how, by taking this large, this 10,000 light year view of this, we actually gain a pretty powerful uh, new way of talking about climate change. One of these is, I just had a New York Times op-ed uh, two days ago about this, is that, you know, this is not about saving the Earth. The Earth is going to be just fine, thank you very much, right? So this is, this so often gets framed as like, oh, climate change, we have to save the planet. Um, but as I like to say, you know, the planet is not a little furry bunny. That's one of the lessons of understanding um, uh, Earth's history. You know, there are five known mass extinctions. Each one opened up new niches for species to evolve, including like this little critter here, who's, you know, your ancestor, right? This was a mammal that was around during the time of the dinosaurs, and it was only the mass extinction that allowed, you know, uh, uh, she and her, you know, progenitors to lead to us, okay? So even though we're driving a mass extinction, you know, in terms of the long-term history of the Earth, the planet will just use the, that for, um, uh, for, uh, for a new round of evolutionary innovation. So when we talk about sustainability, what we have to be very careful is to understand what are we trying to sustain, right? And what are the moral imperatives that we invoke for doing so? So often, for example, you know, we show these pictures of, you know, polar bears on lonely ice flows to, you know, to, you know, drive some guilt and some, you know, and some action, hopefully. But, but the idea is there, you know, when we think about this is that, oh my God, we can't let the polar bears go extinct. But on the other hand, who's crying for this guy, right? You know, the velociraptors were once around, you know, and they went extinct. Lots of species have gone extinct, okay? So, you know, we need to understand what exactly we're we trying to sustain. Is it the polar bear for itself? Or is it the sort of our framing inside the eco, uh, inside the biosphere? Now, I need to make something very clear, right? Because at this point, some people will get really angry with me. Like, well, you don't care about polar bears. I do care about polar bears, right? But the polar bears get fit into this larger question, which we're not asking. So for sure, climate change is an immediate and possibly existential threat to the project of civilization. It is imperative that we act immediately and you know, with, with some uh, force in order to deal with it. So nothing I'm saying here takes that away. But the problem is, one problem is, why haven't we acted, right? Why, uh, after years, and Johnson brought this up, why haven't we acted? And part of my argument here is that we've had, the story we've been telling us has been able to be co-opted. You know, the story, main story we've been telling has been co-opted by climate deniers as a way of blunting um, our activity. So what are we trying to sustain? sustain? What we really are trying to sustain, if we're being honest, is the climactic conditions that are amenable to a particular kind of civilization. Ours, right? It's technological, it's energy intensive, it's got a pretty high population. I mean, hopefully we can bring the population slowly down, but unless somebody wants to volunteer to, you know, to off themselves, you know, it's going to have a high population for a while. And also what we want is maximum human well-being. Actually, what we want, you know, you can add to this maximum biospheric well-being, including polar bears, right? But we have to understand that really what we're trying to do is we're trying to hold some version of the Holocene, right? We are, we are preferencing, uh, preference, uh, uh, having pre great preference for the Holocene, right? And we have to understand why we're doing that. You know, we should be honest about why we're doing that. And as the, anth as the Anthropocene goes on, one of the things I'm saying is you're, what you're going to be holding is a version of the Holocene. It's not the Holocene anymore because we're here and we're going to have impacts. Um, so by sustaining the Holocene in perpetuity, we take on the role of planetary stewards. And what does that actually mean? Um, what does that make us? How do we fit into nature in particular, right? Um, in some sense, the view I'm advocating, the, a city is no different from a forest from the biosphere's perspective, right? We are what the biosphere is doing right now, okay? So, um, and particularly, what is nature? In a planet that has a technological civilization on it, a large-scale, energy-intensive technological civilization, what is nature? What, what counts as nature anymore? Um, so now I want to come to, you know, the, this will be the second half of the talk, the astrobiological perspective. How actually thinking about planets generically, which is what we should be doing, because that's what we've learned over the last 20 or 30 years. Um, uh, how does this change? How does this reframe everything I've just been saying?
So astrobiology is a relatively new field. It's about thinking about life in its planetary context. It's about thinking about what's happened here and what might happen elsewhere in a deeply scientific and deeply um, uh, uh, interdisciplinary kind of way. So there's been three revolutions that have happened in astrobiology. Um, that we want to address. And the, you know, so clearly astrobiology right now has an n equals one problem, right? We only have one example of life, and you can say like, well, how do you even have a field when you only have one thing to study? The thing is though, that if you take that point of view, you're missing some amazing things that have happened, right? So it's a very data-rich field in the sense of these three revolutions, the discovery of exoplanets, the exploration of our own solar system, and the um, unpacking Earth's 4.5 billion year history. So very quickly, let's sort of look what those are. So number one, exoplanets. So when I was a graduate student, there were no other planets in the universe except our own, right? This question of exoplanets dates back, you can see the Greeks arguing about it, right? So um, uh, uh, Aristotle felt that uh, the Earth was the only world of its kind in the entire universe. Um, and um, uh, you know, other Greek thinkers, the atomists in particular, were very sure that the universe was full of planets and all those planets had life. You follow through history, you can see sort of people switching back and forth. By the 1900s, it was thought that planets were very rare because the way they thought planets would form was that the only, the only way you could get it was two stars passing close to each other and getting gravitational ex, you know, extrusion like taffy. So those, uh, those collisions would be so rare that it was thought that planets, you know, one in a trillion stars would have planets around it. And, and so this went on until 1995, we discovered our first exoplanet, right? And that was, uh, that was it's not often that you get to live at a time when a 3,000-year-old question gets definitively answered. Since then, something remarkable has happened, which is particularly the Kepler mission, which uses transits. When you look for the, uh, the planet passing in front of the star, so the light dims a little bit, that now suddenly we went from you know, sort of a retail planet hunting to wholesale planet hunting. And so now what we know, remarkably, is that every star, pretty much, Every star you see in the sky has a family of worlds around it. I mean, that is remarkable. Planets are everywhere. Other than perhaps the most massive stars, which themselves are very rare, every star has planets. And if you count up five stars, one, two, three, four, five, one of them is going to have a planet in the right place for life to form. It'll be what's called the habitable zone where liquid water can form, and we think water is essential for life. So one out of every five is in the right place for life to form. Okay, so that was one revolution. The other revolution was, you know, we've sent robots, robot emissaries now, robot ambassadors, to pretty much every kind of body in the solar system. Asteroids, comets, we visited every planet in the solar system. We've had rovers rolling around, you know, at least one of them. Um, but we've had stuff touch that touch down on a lot of others. And so we get pictures like this, which, you know, could be Mars or it could be the Mojave Desert. Turns out it's Mars, right? But we've now, you know, we've, this has been decades now that we've been uh, rolling around on Mars and we've learned amazing things. For example, we now know for sure that Mars was a blue world. You know, in the early part of the solar system, Mars most likely looked like this. It was, had a much thicker atmosphere. It had water, you know, you know uh, at least lakes, if not oceans on it. There's uh, strata that we can see that you can estimate, uh, you can do the estimate to show that water would probably hip deep was rushing at about three feet per second um, uh, ac across that channel. So it's you know, remarkable. So what shows us, especially in dealing with climate, is to show people that you know, it's not like we just have the Earth to study when it comes to climate. We have tested our climate models against Mars, against Venus, against Titan, and with those models all, I can predict the weather on Mars basically tomorrow with great accuracy, right? So the idea that these climate models are just kind of, oh, something somebody made up, that's, you know, it's just completely wrong. We know how climate works because we've seen how climate, work now, climate works now on, you know, six different kinds of planets, all very different. So. Uh, the, our study of the solar system has, that's what's taught us to think like a planet, or at least gave us, taught us how to think like a planet without life, right? And then through the Earth study, we're able to think like a planet with life. Um, what's also important is to show that, you know, sustainability is, just like habitability, is probably going to be a moving target. We're going to have to learn to think that way because the Mars used to be habitable, but it certainly isn't now, except for maybe, you know, just very extremophile kinds of creatures. Okay, so that was revolution number two. And then revolution number three, as I kind of already went through, is the unpacking of Earth's history, the great oxidation event, the, um, uh, the thermal maxima that have occurred when the planet was a uh, jungle world, uh, the snowball Earth. We now really have seen that Earth is so many different, ha was, has been so many different planets that in some sense it gives us all those different eras. It's almost like we've got 
nine different planets with life to study by studying the Earth's history, because they were so different. So where, where does all this lead us? Well, um, by using the astrobiological perspective, we can think about the Anthropocene in a broader uh, planet, or broader context, and then this question comes up, right, which nobody ever asks. We all know that we have to build a sustainable version of civilization, but how do we know that's even possible, right? How do we know that's something the universe does? Universe has, makes black holes, universe makes comets, universe makes interstellar clouds of uh, gas. How do we know it makes long-term sustainable versions of energy-intensive civilizations, right? Because it may be that there's just no such thing like that in the universe. So this, by framing it this way, suddenly, you know, we get, uh, we're gonna ask the questions in a very different way. But of course, obviously, it means taking exo-civilizations seriously. Right? And I'm using exo-civilizations rather than aliens for a, uh, a particular reason. Right? So now when I say this, I'm not talking about detection. I'm not talking about going out and finding them, though you know, that is definitely an interesting thing, particularly in the era that we're in when we have all these new exoplanets. Um, I'm not talking about the details of their biology, whether they look like reptiles, whether they have nine you know, fingers on each hand, you know, uh, what kind of sex they have. That's just like, that's not amenable. There's no, I don't have any constraints scientifically to actually address that. Um, and certainly not sociology. Are they communist, capitalist, peace-loving, not? You know, there's just nothing I can do there. What I can do, however, is I can focus on the co-evolution of civilization and a couple and coupled planetary systems in a scientific way. I now know enough to run models of this interaction and ask what the generic response of a planet is when it's got an energy-intensive civilization. Okay, and that's what I'm going to convince you. I'm going to show you a little bit of those results. We've run those models, just actually published them just a little while ago. All right, but so you know, my. My emphasis here is it's really time to start doing this because it matters for us. And that means it's time to take exo-civilization seriously and it's time to stop snickering about it, right? Because anytime you try and bring up aliens, it's always like, aliens, <laughs> you know? Uh, and that was a long time in the scientific community and it's because of prosthetic foreheads, right? <laughs> the reasons we can't talk about aliens seriously is because we've had years of bad t uh, television science fiction where, you know, everybody looks like us but they've got maybe antenna on us. So, you know, we're in a different universe now, right? We recognize the civilization that we've built is the kind of alien civilization we've always been dreaming of on a certain level, right? So, so you know, we need now to get past the snicker factor and ask because that's our own, it's related to our own, you know, survival in some sense, okay? So what I'm gonna tell you now for the next 10, 15 minutes is uh, we're gonna head towards a science of exo-civilizations, okay? Theoretical studies that are relevant to the Anthropocene. So first of all, uh, we have to recognize when we think about exo-civilizations, it's always been a battle between optimists and pessimists, right? If you look at the history of this field. And what I'm going to argue is that not, that, that changes significantly with the new data. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Drake equation, right? So uh, int long, interesting history. The Drake equation was basically a way of uh, figuring out how many civilizations exist right now that we could communicate with. And they did that by breaking up the problem into a bunch of different pieces, the number of stars in the galaxy, the number of the fraction of those stars that have planets, the number of those planets in the habitable zone, um, the fraction of those planets that form life, the fraction of that life that goes on to intelligence, the fraction of that intelligence that develops technology, and finally, as I like to call it, the final factor. Bum, 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 bum. The average lifetime. That's actually the thing we're really interested in. What is the average lifetime of a civilization like ours, okay? So um, I won't go into this in detail, but in a paper that we did in a couple of years ago, um, Woody Sullivan and I used the Kepler data, right? We've got all this data about planets now, which we didn't have before, and we used it to sort of figure out, well, what can you say about exo-civilizations empirically based on all this new data? And what we found is that if you ask the right question, you could say something pretty remarkable. Um, so here's what we could, we define something we call the pessimism line, and it answers the following question. What does the probability for a civilization evolving on a random planet have to be for humanity to be the only time it's ever happened? What's the limit on that probability from this new data that we've gotten uh, so that we're the only time that civilization has ever happened? And we can do this now. We can set an empirical limit on this because we now know if I go back, right, when Drake did his, when Drake wrote down this equation, that was the only term that was known. Now, these two terms have been nailed, okay? So that's a pretty large increase in your understanding uh, for this equation. There's only seven terms in it. So it turns out, the prop for us to be the only time in cosmic history that a civilization has arisen, the probability would have to be 10 to the minus 22 or lower, right? 
One in 10 billion trillion. If the probability for forming a civilization on a planet, you know, nature's gonna set this, right, through its evolutionary process. If it's any larger than this number, it's happened before, okay? That's a pretty small number, okay? You don't have to work very hard in order to get higher than one in 10 billion trillion. As, if, as long as it's bigger than that, we're not the first time there's been a technological civilization, okay? So uh, what that you know, so if you look at like famous pessimists in time, Ernst Mayer or Brandon Carter, I won't go through this. These are people who are like, no, civilizations are really hard to make. They never happen. They're really rare. Their numbers are so much larger than that pessimism line that there's been tens of millions or trillions of civilizations over cosmic space and time. And the reason why it was important to do this, it was because what we're really asking is, if you had a statistical ensemble of alien civilizations, what would their history be? Right? They're all going to go through what we're going through. That's part of the argument, is that it's hard not to trigger an Anthropocene, because a civilization is just a way of taking energy, harvesting energy from your planet, and doing work. Second law of thermodynamics is kind of going to demand that you have some kind of feedback. So um, uh, you know, what this work shows is that it's really not hard. To, you, know, you don't have to work very hard uh, in terms of the probabilities to, be end, uh, to end up with the conclusion that there's been lots of histories. And so, you know, doing thinking statistically about uh, Anthropocenes um, is not a bad idea. So the Anthropocene, it's happened before, probably, right? Which is a remarkable thing. So that's this idea that, like, we look at what's happening with Earth, and, you know, we have this huge political debate. Everybody's freaking out. Because it's as if, like, we're a teenager who's, you know, going through our emotional stuff. And we kind of feel like, you know, nobody's ever gone through this before. And then they talk, you know, they get to an encounter group or something, and they talk to others. They realize, like, oh, everybody's gone through this before. So by modeling this, what can we figure out? So the claim is we know enough about planets and how they respond to forcing, meaning, you know, thermodynamic driving, to begin modeling how any species will drive feedbacks on their planet through energy harvesting and civilization building. So this is what I call, uh, <laughs> with tongue held lightly in cheek, the theoretical archaeology of exo-civilizations. Um, so, you know, how do we do this? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to do dynamical systems modeling. We're going to set up equations for a population interacting with its environment. And this is a time-honored process in population biology, going all the way back to the predator-prey model, uh, where you basically have an equation for the bunnies, an equation for the wolves, and they're coupled, right? Because the, when the wolves eat the bunnies, they get more wolf babies, um, but the more too many wolf babies and there's no bunnies left to eat. So, you know, you can write down these equations, solve them, and you find these uh, oscillations these, uh, that are out of phase Beautifully, you know, the data really match this really well. So population biology, you don't have to assume a lot about population biology other than, you know, you eat more resources, you get more babies. That's, that's the only assumption I'm making in this, these simula or the, the models that we're making. And maybe you can say, okay, well, maybe a life on another planet doesn't do that. But, you know, that seems kind of fundamental to what we think of as life. Um, so, you know, uh, when we thought about doing this, what we imagined is we'd have some phase space of planetary parameters, right? Like energy consumption, population, feedback on the planet. And what we imagined is when we run, ran the models, we'd get different kinds of uh, solutions. So, like, you could imagine um, you start off with a very low population and you're not using a lot of energy per person. And what happens is as time goes on, your technology increases, you start using more energy, your population goes up, you make more babies. But eventually, at some point, you're using so much energy, you're feeding back on the planet, and your, the trajectory of your population will end up you know, heading in this direction, and it gets too large, and perhaps you know, the planet responds, you start having instabilities, wild climate changes, and then your population would, you know, come way back down. You'd basically collapse, right? That's a collapse trajectory. Or you could have a sustainability trajectory where you figure out how to deal with this, and you end up with some nice steady state where your population is, is stable and your feedback on the planet is stable. So this is what we were looking to do when we built our models. And it's very interesting to look at the Earth right now. This is the uh, world energy consumption from 10,000 BC to now. Uh, so that's our energy per capita. This is CO2 concentration, which is the planetary forcing, and this is global population. So those are those, uh, those three things, those three parameters for the Earth. And you see that, yeah, like we're, you know, we're pretty much on a trajectory for something. Enormous cr increase, exponential increase in world population, uh, uh, energy use, and the feedback on the planet. So what happens next, generically? So what we did is, you know, these models, actually the paper just came out recently. Um, I won't go into the equations that we used. These were actually, you know, these were, as you guys all understand, a toy model, right? We tried to capture the essentials of the interaction between a population using a planetary resource, making more babies, but having that planetary resource feed back on the state of the planet so that you end up, you know, the planet drifts away from where it was when you were born, okay, as a civilization. So 
here's what the solutions look like. So in these plots, um, green is the population of the civilization, and red you can think of as planetary temperature. And what we found broadly, even in these simple models, were three classes of, uh, um, of uh, trajectory. First was what we call die-off, right? So here you see the die-off. The population, you know, uh, population r uh, rises very quickly because it's consuming the planet's resource. Um, the, the planet heats up. The planet uh, uh, conditions on the planet change. Um, but uh, so then the, the population overshoots the planet's carrying capacity, how many you know, of that organism the planet can sustain. And then you get a big drop in the number of uh, uh, the population until you come to some kind of nice steady state. But you do it at some cost. So you can lose, in our models, up to 70% of your population. So imagine that everybody you knew, seven out of every 10 you know, people you knew uh, disappeared because of uh, you know, climate-related disasters. Um, so it's not clear that a civilization could survive that. Maybe it could. But, um, but at least you know, the good news here was you did get a steady state in the end. There was also what we called sustainable or soft landing. That was the really good news. Yeah, there's definitely solutions where you change the planet, the you know, red, the temperature goes up, your population goes up, and your energy use goes up, but you come to some steady state. So the models admitted that kind of solution. But there was also the possibility of, the d of collapse. And there's, you know, there's enough in there to be uh, worrisome, where the population rises, the planet goes into a runaway, essentially, just like Venus went into a runaway with the runaway greenhouse effect, why Venus's temperature is now 800 degrees. Um, so this is a different kind of runaway, but the same basic idea, and your population comes all the way down to extinction. Now, whether or not you actually are extinct, what really matters is you can't maintain your technological, highly coupled, you know, networked civilization anymore. So that's, in some sense, what collapse means. It's also interesting, we found these oscillations as well in there. You know, the, po the population rises and then falls and rises and falls. Um, so, but either way, so these were simple models, but they gave us a hint that there are generic classes of behavior in the models, okay? So this leads us to, you know, eventually, so this was a first cut at this. What the next step is we're going to build in real climate models. We're going to build in the response of different kinds of energy sources, right? There's only going to be so many kinds of energy sources a planet uh, gives a young civilization. You're going to have combustion, maybe not fossil fuels, but if there's biomass, you can burn it. Um, wind, solar, etc. So we can build that into these and really have, you know, much more uh, 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 physically accurate kinds of models. And then we can run it for all kinds of planets, planets that are close to the the inner edge of the habitable zone, planets that are further out, planets with, that start with oxygen, planets that start with less oxygen. Uh, we can do all different kinds of things. And from that, what we're going to get is a predict, we're going to make a prediction for this average lifetime. Now, this really matters for us, because if the average lifetime of a civilization is 200 years, we're hosed, right? Because what it means is there's very little wiggle room. You don't have a lot of leeway in the bets you make as you try and navigate your Anthropocene. Almost nobody makes it, right? On the other hand, if your, um, uh, time, if your average lifetime is two million years, yeah, then you can make mistakes. There's a lot of, you know, you can experiment and still make it through. Lots of civilizations manage to make it through their Anthropocenes. So, you know, this is the thing that we're headed towards seeing. And this itself sort of frames what's happening to us now in this, this sense that we are, you know, one species out of many species that have gone through this. And, and you know, we sort of need to think more broadly about w our, our choices in that case. Okay, so. More to the point, because we're almost done here, the astrobiological perspective, what it tells us is that energy harvesting species and their civilizations are simply, are simply something that planets do. Okay? We can't keep thinking of ourselves as somehow special or unique. Um, we are uh, what the biosphere is doing now. Right? Um, the biosphere are comp runs experiments. Planets with biospheres runs exper run experiments over and over again. Um, and we are simply one of those, right? Humans and, and, and our, human beings and our civilization, we're just part of nature. You know, the, the biosphere has done lots of interesting things. It did invented grasslands. That was a new idea at one point, right? Um, and then the grasslands spread across the, the planet, changed the planet's functioning. It invented dinosaurs. It invented blue-green bacteria. We are just what the biosphere has invented and is playing with now. And there's no reason to think that we're going to be what um, uh, happens later. So we're an expression of the planet now, but do we continue to be an expression of the planet? So one of these things, right, so this is very controversial. I can get people really get pissed off at me for this. Um, 
What this means is climate change is not our fault. One of the things I want to push us away from is this narrative we have of that human beings are a plague on the planet. We suck, right? When it comes to climate change, we don't have many stories, right? Many, many sort of species-wide, planetary-wide stories about ourselves because, as I said, it's a new transition. And the only story we have either is it's not happening at all, which is what you get from the climate denialists, or we're terrible, we're horrible, we're a virus on the planet. And what I'm pointing out here is that that's not true. So what do I mean by this, before anybody gets really angry with me? What I mean is that, you know, civilization, have, since its beginning, has done what? It has always looked for energy sources that it can power its, you know, buildings, right? It's irrigation. And we've been doing this since the end of the, uh, the, the Holocene, right? So when we found oil, it wasn't like we were like, I will destroy the planet with this substance. It was like, oh, there's this brown goo, and it's awesome. You can heat your home. You can build internal combustion engines. It was great stuff. We didn't know we were going to trigger climate, right? It was, it was an unintended consequence of the adoption of a particular energy modality, right? Um, but now that we know if we don't do anything, right? Now, not doing anything about it would be our fault. It would be our failure. It would be our folly. It would be why we end up in the garbage heap of civilizations that couldn't manage their transition to maturity. Okay? So, you know, it, 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 this doesn't absolve us from the responsibility of doing something about it, given how important it is. So what I'm trying to do here really is change the narrative, right? The Anthropocene is not a story of inherent human greed. It is not a story of our unworthiness on the planet, and the planet's trying to get rid of us in some sense. It's a, not a story of us as being a plague on the planet. Instead, the Anthropocene is a story, and that we're just waking up to, about planets and their experiments, right? We didn't know about Earth's 4.5 billion year history of life and coevolution until very recently. That is a new story for humanity. And now we have to recognize is how we fit into this, right? Both because it's true and also it's the story we need to understand to make it through the, what we're, the climate change we've triggered. So for me, the true at lesson, so Childhood End, any science fiction fans, right? One of the great science fiction books. Uh, the true lessons of the Anthropocene are that planets have rules and we need to learn them. Right? Planets are machines, right? Uh, and, and we need to understand how they function in order to, uh, re, to put ourselves back into them, right? Sustainability is really, in some sense, an awakened planet in which both the biosphere and the civilization can flourish in entirely new ways. This is a paper we wrote recently where we looked at what would be the thermodynamic properties of a planet with a large-scale civilization on it. And the conclusions we came to, there's got to be some kind of cooperative you know, relationship where we, the civilization makes the biosphere even more productive. Not just for itself, but for, you know, uh, you know not for the civilization's end, but for the biosphere's end. Um, is really, and this is about the adoption of what you know, has been called deep ecological values, where compassion and the identification with life, because we, yeah, we're part of the biosphere, we're not above it, is a kind of primary value. Okay? And this is what's interesting for me. It's actually the completion of Gaia. Right? Remember when I talked about you know, one of the big scientific pushbacks on the Gaia hypothesis was that it was teleological. It had meaning. It had a direction. Right? And we know that evolution is blind. Yet it's blind until something like us shows up. Once you get a technological civilization, you're no longer blind. Right? Uh, uh, the evolution is no longer blind. We bring meaning. We bring direction to now to the evolution of the planet. So this is the idea that goes way back of the noosphere. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of this. So um, there were two versions of this, uh, Teilhard de Chardin, which was a little bit more mystical. He was a, a, a scientist and a Jesuit uh, as well. Um, and he sort of thought of it as the, wor you know, the world being enshrouded in thought or in the world soul. But there's also uh, Verdansky, Vladimir Verdansky, the great uh, geochemist's idea, which was more like, yeah, the, you know, once thought appears on the planet. Now, just like there's a biosphere, there's going to be a, you know, a sphere of thought around it. And um, the interesting thing was de Chardin's version of this, of the world being covered in thought, was the more uh, mystical one was the one that most people know about. But of course, what happened is by, and you know, this is the great place to talk about this, we ended up building a no-sphere, right? I mean, by mistake. We didn't know we were going to make a no-sphere, but like, yeah, right now this room is full of electromagnetic radiations carrying thought. Right? I mean, everybody's cell phone is picking up on the noosphere. So, you know, the idea of um, there being a directionality to the biosphere's evolution once, you know, a technological civilization shows up um, may actually be, you know, now that the world is covered in the noosphere, right? So these, these are the, uh, you know, internet links um, across the planet. That may actually be a natural part of the evolution. 
So, okay. So with all of this for me actually leads, it's a story of hope, right? So I did an Atlantic story about those, that, that, that study of, um, the, the study we did of the different possibilities of inter, uh, interaction between the planet and its, uh, and a planet and a civilization, right? And all the story, I did an Atlantic story on it and it got picked up and everybody was focusing on all the trajectories that led to death and disaster. And it had to be like, whoa, wait a minute, one of the trajectories was sustainability. So like, even those simple models point out to the fact like, yeah, you can do this, you know? I mean, from that simple perspective, you know, if the question is, is sustainability possible? The answer is yes. It may be hard to achieve, but at least it exists according to those very simple models, right? So, the, uh, uh, so I'm hopeful, you know? So in its context, the, um, the in the cosmic context, in some sense, the Anthropocene doesn't ha it's not a story with villains in it, right? As much as I am very angry <laughs> you know, at the people who promote climate denial, they're not villains, they're folly. They are the agent of our folly that will lead us to not uh, 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 reaching our own potential, okay? But from the biosphere's perspective, you know, pl there's, uh, there's planets have histories, they have trajectories, and hopefully you can manage to get yourself on a good one. Uh, and vote out the people who <laughs> are, are keeping you holding back. So it's a story about winners and losers, and essentially what I want to say is that we are cosmic teenagers, and that we need to grow up. So, you know, I think someone has done it, so why can't we? Uh, and I'll end with this. This is a picture. Bill Nye came to the University of Rochester, um, and he gave a talk, and I was amazed. I mean, I, you know, I, I knew Bill Nye when I was a graduate student, you know, in Seattle, but I didn't realize, like, the, uh, how much the student, how much the love the students had for him. And, the, you know, he was there talking about climate change. Now, students can, you know, solve climate change. And these guys were all there, and they were like, yeah! I never saw so much optimism and hope, you know? So, like, I absolutely think this is a, you know, uh, a solvable problem. Um, but we have the wrong story, and until we change that story, we're going to kind of be, our options will be limited. So I thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate your time and listening. I don't know if anybody wants to ask questions, but yes. Uh, I'm curious about um, you know, one part of one slide. Sorry. Possibility of a civilization once you're in the habitable zone, I believe, was 10 to the negative 22. The, not the possibility that the that if we don't know what the actual probability sure, is, sure, right? Sure. The, this yeah. Is the, the, right. Uh, the limit, the pessimism limit. Right. If it's below that, then we're the only time it's ever happened. Right. If it's a, if nature's right. choice for those pro that probability is above that, then there's been lots. I'm wondering if though if you could expand. You basically said, well, that's a really small number. Right. In absolute value, it's very small. Right. So therefore, I'm going to bet that it's larger. Right. That doesn't seem very satisfying to me. There are lots of numbers in nature that turn out to actually be very small, right. smaller than humans would have guessed. And right. lots of numbers that turn out to be hugely bigger than humans would have guessed because we tend to anchor on yeah. numbers yeah. around one. Right. Uh, so can you help? Yes, motivate? no, that's a good point. That's why the history of this debate is important, right? That number doesn't appear out of nowhere. Or, you know, well, I mean, you know, it comes from, that number doesn't appear out of context, right? right? So there have been over the years, over 50 years, people trying to approximate, you know, do some kind of calculation that shows them what this probability should be. And the best of them all is what's, the, what's called the hard step model by Brandon Carter. And that's, and the hard step model has now become, you know, actually essential because you could actually calculate probabilities out of it. And what he did, it's typical brilliant reasoning, you know, uh, where he just basically, he looked at the history of the Earth and said, oh, look, the Earth is only going to be habitable for another billion or half, yeah, maybe a half billion years, and intelligence didn't show up until the end, right? So therefore, it must, intelligence must be hard, right? And so then he came up with this idea, there must have been a bunch of hard steps that evolution had to go through. So from that, he was able to use the correct probability distributions, etc. and he, get, you know, he estimated that there were 10 hard steps. Right? And so then he calculated out of that what that probability had to be, therefore. And he got 10 to the 20. And he concluded in that, there's actually, I put that quote in there, I'd have to switch all the way back, but he basically said, based on this, 10 to the minus 20, sorry. He said, based on this, we are the only time that civilization has ever formed in the history of the universe. Now you do that, you got data, you put it in, you find out, no, actually in your model, in you know, Brandon Carter's model, there's 100 civilizations that have occurred across cosmic history, right? And we now know that there, not know, but now the idea is there's not 10 hard steps, there's maybe only five hard steps. Now again, this is all still, you know, controversial, you know, um, we don't even know if the hard step model is true, but it's the best one that we have that actually gives us, allow, allows us to do something, uh, articulate something numerically. Um, and with five hard steps, you're down to uh, 10 to the minus 15, which means there would have been 10 million um, uh, 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 civilizations over cosmic space and time. So, you know, when you look at the history and what, the, uh, you know, almost no pessimist historically has gone that far down. So, so if, if they were right, there would still have been lots of civilizations. So I hope that helps. Yes.
Yeah. I mean, st still, of course, we are in the realm, you know, until we actually find one, you know, you're going to be dealing with. But the best science we have, the history of this field, people, you know, the, the, the best estimations makes that number very, very small. Yes? Um, I've been watching too much sci-fi lately. <laughs> uh, Excellent. <laughs> um, so I've been watching The, the Expanse a lot. Fabe, best show ever, right? Yeah. Um, what, what do you think the chances of humans actually getting to, the, to a full solar system wide? Or? What I argue often is that's the prize. If we make it through climate change, that's what's waiting for us. I mean, I really do believe, you know, interstellar travel, I'm actually right now writing a paper about the Fermi paradox. Interstellar travel may be very, very difficult. But interplanetary travel, especially if you have some kind of fusion engine, will not be. And um, I think, you know, in another 200 years, like, who knows, right? There are obviously very formidable problems. But I'm hopeful, you know, I'm a techno-optimist, and I'm hopeful that, you know, uh, you know, in 200, 300 years, there can be a lot of people uh, you know, the, the solar system, there's a lot of nooks and crannies that, you know, human beings can, uh, and, and, you know, people say, well, why would they do that? Because, you know, basically, everybody wants to create their own society. There's, you know, that, well, I love the expanse gets rights. There's going to be Mormons in space, for sure. So they can create their own space settlement and live Mormon life. And there'll be, and, you know, a thousand versions of that. So um, I think, yeah, if we can just figure out climate change. And they're related, right? Because you're not going to be able to, in order to, you know, to solve climate change, you have to think like a planet. But in order to have a self-sustaining, you know, whatever, bubble civilization with a million people in it, you also have to understand how planets think and build a, you know, smaller version of it. That's why The Expanse gets so well in, you know, the scene after the, uh, after, what is it, Callisto, or Ganymede, after the station on Ganymede collapses, and, and what's his name, Pack recognizes that, oh my God, the whole, infra the ecological infrastructure of the thing is going to collapse now. Is anybody watching The Expanse? Are people watching The Expanse? It's really good. I really got it. And the books are super awesome, too. Yes? Uh, so you alluded it to it in that previous answer, but I'm curious what your thoughts are about the Fermi Paradox. And yeah. Theory, like, why do you not see anyone? Well, first of all, I want to, you know, there's two things, there's two ways to think about the Fermi Paradox. The first one is the idea that, um, you know, we haven't found anybody, you know, we've been searching the stars for signals and we haven't found anything. And that's just not true. I mean, there's never really been a large-scale SETI effort, right? SETI's never been really fully funded. NASA, you know, NASA started to do a large SETI search, and then because of William Proxmire, it stopped it. So as Jill Tarter says, if, you know, if the parameter space we have to search for looking for aliens is the ocean, we have looked at a thimble so far. So saying that we haven't found anything is just, it, you know, that's just not scientifically valid. So we've barely begun to look, not just in radio, but all the other possibilities. And, um, but if you're asking about the part of the Fermi Paradox is why haven't we been visited? Like, why, isn't, why don't we have evidence for, you know, a civilization, the colonization part? That actually we find in our paper is more of a problem. And so the solution to that... Uh, right now in the paper, I think we're leaning towards is that interstellar travel is really hard. You don't get many successful colonization missions. You know, obviously there's some assumptions here uh, in this. Um, but again, you know, we just did a paper uh, recently where with, I did it with Gavin Schmidt from Goddard Institute of Space Studies, where we just asked, how would you, this was an amazing question, how would you know whether there was a previous technological civilization on Earth 20 million years ago? You actually couldn't. Right? There's very, you know, and there there's would not be much left over. Um, there would certainly after, by 20 million years, the surface has been completely, you know, uh, re-scoured. So you're not going to find ruins or any, you'd have to look for isotopic anomalies or something, which maybe. Well, that's the thing. No, no, he's right, actually. That's the, that, that is exactly what you'd have to look for. So when it comes to just the Earth itself, the Earth has been weathered so heavily and subducted that it would be hard. And so, you know, there's been a couple papers on exactly that, about that the best place to look for this is going to be on other bodies. So, yes? So kind of related to that, uh, I think the seems to be the one part where you really do have the N equals 1 problem is what you were talking about, the, the, the noosphere, right? Um, because you have all this evidence for what happened previously in Earth, and we have all these other right. planets out there. But a lot of the stuff, especially with the Fermi paradox, it seems to me falls prey to this n equals one problem. We're sort of assuming that intelligent or the civilization is going to do, is going to behave like we expect. Well, I think that's why that's why my models tried to have no sociology in them. It's ba the only assumption was a civilization consumes energy to do work. That's like the only assumption in there. So I don't need a no-sphere or anything else. It's just that. Do you make assumptions about what sort of energy production? Uh, there's, only, there's only so much kind of energy production you're going to get as a young civilization, right? The, the planet's only going to afford you. You know, if you have Z-rays, some like super hyper high, high technology, well, then you're already past this anyway, right? If you have warp drives, you're not really worrying about your, you know, you've probably gotten, your science is so far advanced 
that you know the bio you probably have already gone through this but if you're a young civilization like ours you've got biomass or you've got you've got you can burn things there's wind there's solar there's nuclear um, and there's um, geothermal right and that's pretty much it it's, you can't you know maybe on some weird planet you could have like super magnetic fields or something so what you can do for each one of those you can evaluate what the thermodynamic effect of using it large scale so for example there was a paper done a few years ago where they looked at trying to extract from wind energy the power what would the consequences be of powering a civilization via wind and what you find is because of turbulence downstream you end up with you know the equivalent of like two degrees of warming so which is important because what it means is you can't power a civilization like this and have no impact the, and th so this goes back to nature, right? The idea that there's going to be a, we're going to be able to return to pristine nature, not with us on the planet, right? You can have lower impact that you're going to have to be. You're going to have to figure out what kind of impacts. But the idea that you can have no impact is just doesn't make sense. So yeah, you can evaluate for every different kind of energy source, you know, at least make a cut at what the impact would be. So then one more, the assumption you're making is that civilization requires energy. And that seems to me that's something that I think a lot of, that seems to be a very economist way of viewing things. Um, well, I don't see that's a thermodynamic. I don't say if you, a civilization. I mean, by you know, in some sense, by definition, an industrial civilization. You know, I mean, Rome. I'm not interested in Rome, right? Because Rome wouldn't ha Rome wouldn't push its planet into the, an Anthropocene, right? So you know, if a civilization decides to get up to Rome's level and never gets farther, yeah, that's sort of out of the you know. I'm, so you're right. That that's not what I'm talking about. But if you build an industrial civil, if you start hard, it's all about the energy per capita, right? So right now, all of us have the equivalent of of just from our home when we pl you know go home and our plugs. 50 servants. That's the energy equivalent of 50 servants. And that doesn't say anything about your transportation or whatever. So once a species gets to the point where the per capita energy use becomes more than one individual's worth per individual, that's when you're going to start feeding back. So that, that's the only assumption. If they start doing that, then they sort of fall into the category that I'm interested in. And then, you know, I don't really care about sociology or whether they develop a no-sphere or not. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. It's just that they're harvesting energy to, to do the work of building their civilization. So um, do you think that the, the current problem we're facing is a matter of marketing, that we have the tools and sort of the guidance that, that we need to get through it if we all just somehow band it together? Yeah, I think that's, you know, there was, I was just reading recently about a study that, you know, sort of showed a super detailed study that you could actually power you know, the world with renewables, with wind, water, you know. But, it, you know, the thing, but, you know, so it was a really detailed plan for doing it. Of course, it required this, you know, sort of, you know, World War II Manhattan-style project for the entire world, and so that's going to be hard. But in terms of, like, technologically, man, unleash the innovation. Let us, that's one of the, you know, when I go out and I'm talking to people, one of the things I'm saying is, like, you know, on one level, climate change shows how awesome we are, right? I mean, as you know, we've changed the atmosphere of an entire planet. That's pretty good for a bunch of hair, hairless monkeys, you know? Um, and now the question is, are we smart enough to innovate our way, you know, into some kind of sustainable version of this? So it's, you know, so it's not just marketing, though. It's deeper than that. It's myth, right? Human beings always need stories. That, you know, as somebody said, you know, stories were the first technology. And the problem is, you know, we have all of these from the, you know, long history of humanity. We have these myths about the coming of age, about marriage, about old age. Um, uh, but we don't have any, and we have creation myths. But climate change, we don't have a myth for because it's new. We've never done this before. And so what I'm suggesting is, is that, you know, a first, it's not like this alone is going to solve anything. But if we don't change the narrative, we are stuck arguing with people about whether we change the climate or not. From this perspective, that question just disappears. It's like, of course you change the climate. You built a civilization that consumes a quarter of the entire biosphere's productive capacity. You know, what did you expect? So I think it just, you know, one of the things in revolutions, in scientific revolutions that happen is that the old questions, when you go through a paradigm shift, it's not that the old questions are answered. The old questions don't even become meaningful anymore. People ask a new set of questions. And that's at least what I'm proposing with this. Yeah. Uh, this might tread a little bit more philosophical, although they're clearly philosophical ideas. Yeah. Isn't there too? Um, you mentioned that you're an optimist, and I'm piggybacking on the question about marketing. I sort of uh, my worry is that there is not, in fact, at present in human thinking, the idea that humanity is in fact a single species. Yeah. That we can sort of think about this. As a, collab as a truly collaborative project. And I think one way to be pessimistic about this is to worry about factional yeah. and whatnot. Do you have 
thoughts that make you more optimistic on that? Is it sort of, uh, and I'm not saying that blind faith would be unreasonable, perhaps it's yeah. the only way to think about it. Yeah, I mean, it's gotten us through a lot, right? <laughs> um, but no, actually, so, so I think when you look across species, you know, I, I, you know, I feel confident in my bones uh, that there have been other civilizations, right? You know, scientifically, I can only go far as the probabilities that this has happened before. And what I imagine is the ones that make it have either the evolutionary, you know, uh, background to have the right kinds of behaviors. Maybe, maybe hive mind. It's much easier if you're a hive mind to make it through this than if you're uh, the kind of thing that we are. But the other possibility is that, you know, you evolve under pressure, right? You know, selective pressure is what determines uh, evolution. And, you know, perhaps this is the agent by which we start to, to uh, uh, create new behaviors. You know, the Paris Accord was weak, but the Paris Accord was also remarkable in the sense that we got every country to sign this thing. So that was a beginning, and then we took a giant step <laughs> back. Um, but, you know, so I think, you know, this is, this may, the cl you know, the Anthropocenes may be the agent for some kinds of species, perhaps like ours, to develop new evolutionary behaviors that allow them to get through. And if you make it through, you know, it's weird, like, if I put my hat on as a dad, I'm like, oh my god, we got to make it through. <laughs> but if I put my hat on as an astronomer, I'm like, eh, some make it through, some don't, you know. Nothing special about us. Yeah, nothing special about us. Okay. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate you guys coming today. <laughs>